Hello and a very good evening, afternoon, daytime, wherever it might be for you. I'm Ryan and I'm happy to join you here. We have Jim coming in from Painesville, Ohio. And if you are here, please do let me know. You can type in the comments on Facebook. If you're watching on YouTube at the same time, you can add your comments there. We are live. I am listening. Your comments much appreciated here tonight. We have Charles coming in from Cincinnati. Hey, hey, Charles, nice to see you again. Now, this show, if this is your first time joining us here, and Paul's coming in from Victoria, BC, Canada. Hey, and Dan coming in from Florida. We have a Floridian coming up in the show here soon. If this is your first time watching the show, this show is all about the Linking Ring magazine, which I I can't even hold up a copy. I don't own any physical copies of the Linking Ring since I moved. It's all digital, which means we have access to every single Linking Ring magazine published going all the way 99 years back. That's a lot of Linking Ring. It's a lot of magic. And this show is all about digging into those pages and seeing what we find. And welcome everyone as we come in. We have people coming in from around the world. Past presidents of the IBM are here. Oscar and Joe, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I want to get right into some magic. Uh, I don't want to, I, I have a habit, I get carried away, I talk a lot. I don't want to lose sight of the point of all this, which is the magic. So just today, I thought I wanted to add one more trick to the show. And I went researching. So this is a quick demonstration of a trick I found in the pages of the Linking Ring. Well, it's, it's a variation of a classic trick, which you may know this is a, a piece of string, a yellow piece of string, which is a normal piece of string, which means if you hold on to the ends and you do not let go of the ends, there is no physical way to tie a knot in a piece of string if you don't let go of the ends, right? You can, you can wrap it around, you can go through, you can go back, you can make what looks like a knot, but as long as you don't let go of those ends, no knot will be able to form. That's how string works. That's how your arms work. It's a loop and it can't... However, I found this. Ooh. Ah. A red piece of string, but not normal string, because look, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm not going to let go of the ends. I'm going to go around, I'm going to go through, and I'm going to go back without letting go of the ends. And yet, even though it looks exactly the same, watch. Aha! A knot forms in the rope. It's, it's crazy. You know, you can do that all day long with the yellow rope. The exact same movements, no matter how fast, no matter how slow, if you go through and back. No knot. And yet, the right now, some people may watching this may know this is the GW Hunter puzzle knot. You can go through and back, and it looks like a knot, and it in fact is a knot, but only on the red string. That's the GW Hunter puzzle knot. It's in very it's on a lot of old magic books. But this is the variation I found today that I thought was kind of an interesting wrinkle on it. Because it's not the technique, it is obviously the rope. The yellow rope doesn't tie, the red rope does, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to take them both through the exact same course. I'm going to hold them side by side. Yellow rope, red rope. Watch. <laughs> Wherever the red rope goes, the yellow rope goes. Wherever the yellow rope goes, the red rope goes. And it seems as though that is a tangled mess. Both ropes... <laughs> I did say I learned this today, right? Give me, a, give me a little bit of patience. Okay, even though they both look exactly the same, they both look equally tangled. Watch. If I take those off. Let's see if I was able to do this. It looks as though there is a knot in both, but remember... Oh, there is a knot in both. <laughs> Hang on one second. Let me, let me back up one second. As I said, I just found this today and I was excited. I thought it was a neat idea. I wanted to share it with you, which is the point of this show, finding neat ideas and sharing them. Okay, we'll try this again. 
Wherever the red rope goes, the yellow rope goes. Through and back. And that gives us... Uh, yeah, okay. Gives us a tangled mess. <laughs> Be very careful here. But yet, if we dump this off of my hands... Aha! Look. Even though they both follow the exact same path, there is indeed no knot in the yellow string, but there is a knot in the red string. The secret to this, of course, is that this rope is made out of the same thing they make headphones out of. So it just gets tangled automatically. That's, that's the secret to that. No, the secret to that is published in the Linking Ring magazine. And I have a reference for you, as I do throughout this show. Everything I mention, I do try and point you to the source. This is the TK Knot. And it was published by Tom Cracker in a fairly recent Linking Ring magazine, March 2020, page 90. So if you know the GW Hunter Puzzle Knot, uh, as I do, and I love performing it, when we get back <laughs> around real people again, that is a little addition you can try out. I thought it was a nice, clever twist on that. So that is just some of the magic we find hidden away. They always say if you want to hide an idea in magic, put it in a magazine. But not on my watch, no siree. And thank you, Rod, and thank you, Joe, for, for watching. Got applause coming in. I very much appreciate that. That is the closest thing we can get to the real thing here in the virtual performances. And more people. Our good friend Christopher Beck is coming in from Southwest Missouri. Chris is one of the uh, regulars here on the Tuesday Night Series. And Danny coming in from Saskatchewan. I'm yeah, born in Saskatchewan, probably very cold there right now in the middle of uh, Canada. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to uh, welcome our first guest of, of the evening. And I, I've invited this guest to be a part of the show because more and more I'm realizing that this is one of the people who keeps the wheels on the bus when it comes to the International Brotherhood of Magicians. <laughs> I, I sat in and assisted with the the mid-year meeting on Saturday, the business meeting for the IBM. And they they and that's exactly the whole point of the meeting is they keep the wheels on the bus, and no one more than this person right here. So please welcome to our virtual stage, Simone Marin. Hi, Simone. Thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> My pleasure. So. Uh, I, as I said, I, the, the more I've got to know you, the more I've realized how much you're doing behind the scenes. And you're, you're a bit of a behind the scenes person. So I thought I'd use this opportunity to maybe uh, let people see your lovely face and get to know you personally, rather than just the work you do. I guess it's because I don't have a life. So that's why I gave up my time. <laughs> National Brotherhood of Magicians. <laughs> now, so I, I know you, you know you've probably seen Simone's work if you've if you've been a part of the IBM. You've seen her in the Lincoln Ring, writing numerous articles and numerous profiles and convention reports, and you've also probably seen her at conventions. <laughs> uh, I don't know, like 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 I said, you're often a behind the scenes person helping out. You help at the IBM convention, running the Lance Burton Teen Seminar. But more than anything else, you help at every convention you go to as an unofficial chauffeur. Is <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how I first met you, actually. Uh, at Magic Live, it was with a group that needed to go somewhere in Las Vegas. And a very friendly lady was willing to drive us there. And <laughs> well, if I have a car, I'll do it. <laughs> But anyhow, Simone, uh, so you you have published a shocking amount of articles in the Linking Ring. <laughs> w when did you get started on this? Uh, and do you remember what your first article was you contributed? I think that my first article might have been, and I'm not 100% sure about this, it may have been on Creativity at Sea many years ago. Yeah, uh, the, uh, Barry Mitchell's convention. Yeah, get, uh, Barry Mitchell and Tim Sonnefeld. 
I started writing, I just I had such a wonderful time there. I wanted to share my experience with people. So I wrote the article and I guess Sammy liked it because he published it. <laughs> so then I started going to conventions and writing articles about my experiences there. And then um, when my my brother, Oscar Munoz, came in as uh, IBM president in 2016, he asked me to write his cover story. So that was my very first cover story mm -hmm. in July of 2016. It was my honor to do that. Yeah, I, a, a number of stories, including this most recent issue. You have written uh, the, the cover story in, in most cases, uh, but profiles of some of the best in our business. I've been very fortunate. Um, I don't know. I just seem to have lucked in to becoming friends with a lot of these people or becoming friends with their friends. Uh, the, the biggest um, light in my life was Eugene Berger. Uh, he introduced me to virtually all the, the magicians that I've become friends with since. Um, he introduced, introduced me to John and Pam Thompson and they became a very big part of my life. And through them and through Eugene, uh, I just met so many wonderful, wonderful people. One of the, the cover stories I wrote was about Darren Brown. I would never have had the opportunity to meet him if it hadn't been for Eugene. Eugene was a good friend of Darren's and we went to New York to see him and went out for dinner with him. And then Eugene just said to him, Darren, tomorrow you're coming to our hotel. Simon's going to interview you. <laughs> so that's, that's how the story came about. <laughs> yeah, no matter what Eugene says, you listen. It's, oh, yeah. it's a very compelling voice. How did you get to know, how did you meet Eugene? Um, I met Eugene at the McBride Magic and Mystery School. At, well, I find, first met him in 2003 at the Daytona Festival of Magic, it might have been four. Um, and then I wouldn't say we became great friends at that point, but then in 2009, I went to the Mentalism Masterclass and he and I just completely hit it off and became really close friends. Mm -hmm. And he became one of the most important people in my life. So I'm very lucky. It was, the day I met Eugene was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I know you, you're in Las Vegas now living in Las Vegas, but you originally, I, I guess, I first heard of you coming from Florida and, and the Jacksonville ring. And I saw as I was looking up uh, in past issues, you were rookie of the year at the Jacksonville ring in 2006. <laughs> right. And I, I became secretary uh, in 2006 of IBM ring 130 Jacksonville. And uh, I, I, I was a secretary for, I think, like 10 years. So I don't think I ever missed uh, a, a, a ring report, writing a ring report mm -hmm. in all that time. So that was actually <laughs> that, that alone is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably my earliest publication in the linking ring was as yes. the ring secretary for 130. But I think that that right there to me sums up uh, what you do is that you had just joined this ring in Jacksonville and immediately you are now secretary for like you just <laughs> you're so you're always willing to help and and jump in and your excellent skills of, of organization which i sorely lack <laughs> as i said you you keep the wheels on the bus not only with the ibm you said you you've worked with uh, local rings and conventions and uh, the magic and mystery school and, and you are a facilitator for so much magic well i actually have a i'm actually the social coordinator for magic and meaning at the magic and mystery school and i'll never forget the day eugene called me and he said we want to give you a title and he said i wanted to give you social director but i think the director is too foo foo for you <laughs> he said, then we decided maybe social chair but we didn't think you would want the name of a piece of furniture so we're going with social coordinator <laughs> And, and uh, Joe Turner, past IBM president, says, fact, I couldn't have gotten through my presidential year without Simone's help and counsel. Oh, he's so and, sweet. <laughs> and I heard, I heard the exact same thing said uh, by Stephen Bargatze this past Saturday. Stephen, he's a sweetheart. He really he is. is. So much fun working with him. He's so funny and keeps me laughing and keeps me on my toes. <laughs> he's been amazing. <laughs> so as you've been... Uh, you know, I don't want to say rubbing elbows with, because that's that's not your intent. It's just by virtue of being there and, and pitching in, you bump into a lot of people. 
Um, so you've had this chance to, to interview and talk with so many magicians. What, what are the lessons that you've learned? What, what stands out as, as you know, the lessons learned from talking with these people? Well, one thing I've learned is that people like to be written about. <laughs> so that's actually a really good in to, to get to interview them because you just tell them, I'd like to see if I could get your story on the cover of a magazine. And there's nobody that's going to say no to that. I mean, really, unless they don't trust you. <laughs> so you're saying you can appeal to a magician's ego. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy thing to do. But also, I've been really lucky living in Las Vegas. I've made so many great friends with people that if I hadn't been here, I probably would never have had the opportunity to get close to. And and for example, this month's cover, Jerry McCambridge. Um, Jerry, I've known Jerry for years, but just in the last couple of years, we became like brother and sister. And he calls me sis, I call him bro. And he is an amazing performer. And I was so delighted to be able to get his story on the magazine. Yeah. That was really and that's, that's as, as you said, that's this month, January 2021. You can yes. read about his. Yes. But, but I also, I mean, I managed to get other Vegas magicians. I got David Goldrake, I got Chris Angel, Mike Hammer. Um, I put all of them on the cover too. And uh, I'm actually making a, a collection of all my, my covers signed. I think I've got 11 of them now. Um, well, that's an really amazing souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want them framed on the wall. So that's my, <laughs> that's my goal to do with these. The only one, on, sadly, that I didn't get signed was Gary Darwin because he passed away before. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to get that one signed, but I'm so happy that he managed to get his hands on the magazine before he passed because mm -hmm. he wanted that so badly. Lance begged me to do an article on him. He didn't have to beg very hard. But <laughs> <laughs> so. Now, you, you had mentioned you, you attended the Magic and Mystery School for a mentalism program or session. So is that your primary interest in, in magic as a... I, I love mentalism. I have attended the mentalism masterclass every year with the exception of 2019 because I went on a Mediterranean cruise over the dates and everybody was telling me, you need to call in every day to make sure that you, you check in with us while the mentalism masterclass is on. I didn't, but um, yeah, I, I love it. And I challenge Jeff every year to find me new material and he does it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's never repeating stuff, so it's just wonderful. I, I think the world of the Mystery School, I think they're just one of the best teaching uh, facilities in magic. I think they're the best, without a doubt. Hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't had the opportunity to attend, but certainly at conventions, uh, you know, the lectures from Jeff McBride and Eugene Berger were always so uh, rich in, you know, it's those the little details, like certain little <laughs> details from their lectures stand out to me now decades down the road. <laughs> right, right. And that's what I found, especially with the Lance Burton Teen Seminar. Uh, my kid attended it. I've already, actually, I wrote an article about him in the Linking Ring in the last few months. <laughs> A <laughs> cover story? <laughs> no, no, no. So he, I think he was getting pissed off at me because I've been doing the Lance Burton Teen Seminar par past participants, where mm. are they now column. And I think I've written 28 of them now. And I think when I was getting to about number 23, Travis was, well, you know, I'm your son and you haven't done me yet. And I'm a past participant. <laughs> I'm going to give him a column. So, so I think the 24th one was on him. But that that is so dear to my heart, the Lance Burton Teen Seminar. Mm -hmm. uh, Travis attended it. I want to say it was back in like 2008, 9 and 10. Um, when it was still part of the World Magic Seminar. And I was just so delighted when I heard that the IBM was going to take it over in 2013. Um, and yeah. I, I hel I've helped out every year with them, you know, a little bit here and there. But then in 2019, was 2018? I, well, 2018, I was running registration at the IBM convention. 2019, I, I ran the um, administration part of the Lance Burton Team Seminar. And as Lance and Eugene always said, the, the Lance Burton Teen Seminar is the most important thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2020, I, I did the administration part for the online one, and I'm also doing the one for 2021. It's so dear to my heart. And these kids, you know, where they have gone to after 
completing the seminar and the friendships they've made, all of them have become such close friends for, for life. And um, Jeff will say to them every year, look around you. These people that are sitting around you now will be in your life for the rest of your life. And it's true. They all yeah. have that same thing. I, they feel that same thing. I know a number of people who, who have gone through that program. Unfortunately, like I was too old. Uh, by the time I learned about it, I was trying to figure out ways to sneak in. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got to sneak in in 2019 as administrator. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> and I got to attend a Zoom one yeah. this year. Well, if, if, you, if you ever need someone to deliver the pizza for lunch, I'm <laughs> willing, ready and willing. <laughs> It is incredible. It really is. It's life changing. Mm -hmm. And can now you, we're off. Can, for those of us who are who are too old for this, can you give us a hint about <laughs> what what goes on inside that room? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So first of all, it, it's free to all IBM youth members between the ages of thirteen and nineteen. Um, this past year, we also decided that we were at least for the next year anyway going to give any of our youth members 18 and under a free registration for the convention so that there's absolutely no financial cost to actually attend. So any local kids from where the convention is going to be like it is in Pittsburgh this summer, uh, they have no, no expenses. It's really a, a wonderful opportunity for them. So they start on, um, on the, the, the Monday evening, they, usually the convention starts Wednesday at lunchtime. So Monday evening for three or four hours, they get together and the, and the parents can come in at that time as well. And they get introduced to the facilitators, uh, Jeff, Larry, Lance, of course, it used to be Eugene. And they spend the evening with them as and each of them do a little bit of performing and get told about what's going to happen over the next couple of days. The Tuesday is an all day session from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m and the parents are not allowed to attend that um not during the day anyway and they there they have guest entertainers come in usually some of the entertainers that have been hired to work at the convention and they'll come and talk to the kids and teach them they have teaching sessions with lance and they have teaching sessions with larry and jeff and a multitude of people will come through and speak to them the last couple of years we've done movie night on the Tuesday night, so we'll show some kinds of magic movies and, and the um, parents are allowed to attend that. And then we wrap it all up in the Wednesday um, and it's done by lunchtime in case any of the kids want to compete so they don't miss any of the convention. It's, it's just a, a, such a fantastic experience for them. Also, this past year, we did works in progress, both in Zoom and then in 2019 in Scottsdale. So if the kids were working on something, they could volunteer to show their piece to the masters and get criticism about it afterwards. Wow. Obviously, constructive criticism, which is absolutely <laughs> invaluable. I mean, you, you can't pay for that kind of um, that kind of advice. It's just incredible. Yeah, they, they never forget this. It's just such an amazing experience for them. Yeah, and, and you know, it's it's the the proof is in the pudding, and the 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 people who come out of that program and, and the path they walk, uh, yes. as, as you are well aware, because that's exactly what your series is about. Uh, right. Uh, mm -hmm. I, um, that. I would say that out of all the people I've interviewed, uh, that's the, that's the article. That's this the most recent one. Uh, yeah, and you said you've done 26 of these. So you can... yeah. yeah, I just finished writing one. Don't tell anyone and for the February issue. It's going to be on Hiroki Hara who was the, the star of the movie Make Believe. He won the contest that year. Don't tell anyone, people. Okay? I, I won't. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and, and I'm just probably going to wrap it up in October of this year. We'll have reached the three-year mark. Yeah. And my, my goal is to take these articles and put them together in a digital book and provide these to all the attendees of the future Lance Burton Teen Seminars. So they can see, you know, where everybody went. <laughs> I mean, Shin Lim was one of the people. Mm -hmm. so can't go much further than that. <laughs> All these young whippersnappers. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> yeah, Sean's saying, don't tell anyone except all of Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they they won't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and if nothing else, you can read about it. 
right in the linking ring that's like the the, the catch line of this show if you want to know more read it in the linking ring <laughs> Well, Simone, I, I will bid you uh, adieu for tonight. Thank you so much for, for stopping in. and um, My pleasure. I, I very much look forward to the next chance to meet you at a convention. Yeah, me too. I can't wait to get out of this house. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, right. Ryan. Have a good night, Simone. You too. That was Simone, as I said, the one who keeps the wheels on the bus for, for the IBM as the international secretary, uh, writing so much for the Lincoln Ring and contributing everywhere she goes. Uh, and a, a great inspiration and I think a model. I have always said, you know, if, if you join a magic club, you get out of it what you put into it. And if no one steps up to perform, well, that's because you're not stepping up to perform. <laughs> it's a... The cycle goes on, so I think Simone is leading the way and showing us by example how to participate in magic, how to get more out of magic. I think she's benefited from it, and I think you will too. I've been doing this show as, as a something to do, and I benefit from it. I have so much fun. I get emails from people around the world, and it's great. So that's my message uh, for everyone. Just, just get out there and do stuff. <laughs> now... Let's try some more magic here. Uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip to a segment with a fancy intro, which tonight is, is going to be seat of the pants, but I'm going to play the fancy intro regardless. I'm not even putting on my news jacket tonight because it's real cold here. I'm keeping my sweater on. Uh, this is a segment called Really, Really Late Magic News, and it is digging through the pages of the Linking Ring magazine to find uh, all sorts of news that is not at all newsworthy because it's 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. Uh, but it's interesting. This is a collection of tidbit, uh, tidbits. It's like a, a relay race of magical knowledge that's passed from... Anyway, it's, it's interesting. So, let's start with a report from Francis Marshall, the column Around Chicago from January 1989. <clears throat> she wrote, The Chicago Tribune carried a story out of the old Chicago memory banks. This one having to do with twin theaters, the Harris and Selwyn, that used to be across the street from our magic shop. Thurston was playing one of them. John Barrymore, in a drama All My Children, the other. Thurston was featuring a trick in which the assistant climbed into the barrel of a cannon, and just before Thurston shot it off, the assistant slipped out through a false bottom, made his way through a stage trap door to the basement of the theater. He was supposed to run around and enter the theater through the front door. So as the cannon boomed and belched smoke, the assistant would come running down the aisle, waving an American flag, his hair smoking from a hidden smoke bomb. The audience would think he'd just been shot out of the cannon over their heads and somehow survived. On opening night, the assistant didn't notice the twin entrances of these two theaters. He followed the stage directions all the way to the front door of the house, but it was the wrong one. Barrymore was on stage with his big scene when this flag-waving apparition came charging down the aisle. He took one look at him, stepped out of character, and shouted, get that fool out of my theater right now. <laughs> I wonder what was happening in the other theater. <laughs> Thurston was there, <laughs> wondering what had gone wrong. Next, from January 1970, a column called Ledger Dermania from Lou Derman, who covered the Hollywood magic news. Flash! You won't believe this! Senator Clark Crandall, the Windy City's windiest, has been approached by Milt Larson to move out west and work at the Magic Castle as official host. Of course, Larson was stoned at the time he made the offer. But Crandall couldn't have been sober because he accepted. I predict the senator will make a magnificent host, 
But then I also once predicted the Titanic would have a smooth first voyage, and I picked the Mets to finish last, so don't go by me. Knowing how strong Clark comes on, castle guests won't get to meet the man right away. There's too much danger of getting the bends. Instead, they will first be ushered into a dark little room where they will be screamed at by bats. Fifty monkeys will drop coconuts on their heads, and a mule will kick them down a flight of stairs. They will then be ready to meet the senator. Actually, I think the guy is fabulous choice, and I hope he decides to stay on permanently. Vernon is starting to make too much sense lately, and we desperately need a new kook. Welcome aboard, Senator, while I climb into a lifeboat. <laughs> I always love finding those old columns where they're kind of poking fun at each other. A little bit of gossip in the magic world from 40 years ago. 50 years ago. 50-year-old <laughs> gossip. That's the kind of gossip I like. But we're going to go back further than that. Because the most recent edition of The Linking Ring features uh, one of the regular columnists with um, this column from our UK correspondent, Brian Lead. And he writes, As we move into another year, it is time to celebrate the centenary of the sawing, a girl, sawing through a girl illusion which has provided an enduring magical motif nestling in the public consciousness between the rabbit from hat and the zigzag girl, although the cups and balls no doubt beats them all in its longevity. And in this article, Brian is going briefly over the history of the, the illusion of sawing through a girl, which debuted January 17th, which was two days ago, uh, January 17th of 1921, a uh, hundred years ago. You may have seen the big celebration on Sunday, the Magic Circle. However, that wasn't actually the first performance per se. Um, it had been demonstrated before, uh, the, about a month ago, in December. Uh, it was demonstrated before Masculine at St. George's Hall and... The illusion had been conceived in Selbert's apartment at 54C High Street, the first, and it was first worked on Fred Culpit's kitchen table using a girl named Jen, Jan Glenrose, who must have been the first woman to be sawn through. Now, Uh, Brian writes here, Salbert performed the illusion on the prestigious Royal Variety Show in December 1922, and soon it was all the rage. Peter Warlock commented it was possibly the greatest explosion of a single illusion in the history of magic, culminating in hundreds performing it all over the world. And that is the story of the sawing through. Not just one magician, but literally hundreds of magicians performing this trick. And I went digging. Uh, this is an article going back to January 2009, and Samuel Patrick Smith, you may know as the esteemed editor of the Linking Ring magazine, wrote a column called Letters from the Past, and it is a letter from Horace Golden, who is one of the people uh, who claims to have invented the sawing through a woman illusion. Now, this article actually spans over three editions, January, February, and March of 2009, and it is a four-page typed-up rant from Golden writing to Carter the Great because Carter claimed to have invented the sawing the lady in half, and Horace Golden did not stand for that. In fact... He said such things as this. Uh, where is my... Yeah, see, uh, fellow illusionist Charles Carter, whom Golden had known since their youth, offered to buy the rights to Song in, Song in Half, but Golden refused. Carter later hired Thayer Magic Manufacturing to build a version for him and began presenting it in Germany. And Carter started claiming that he was the inventor of this illusion. 
This is an excerpt from the letter here. My impression of you has changed since reading your epistle, as I never dreamt that you could ever type letters so utterly devoid of real facts and so overflowing with untruths. No, Charlie, you are wrong in your statements. You always will be wrong. The fact remains undisputed and unchallenged by those who are in possession of true details. I did sawing a woman in half illusion before you. Had it not been for Thayer, I doubt whether you would have been able to pinch it. Don't you remember in 1921, you called on me at the Palace Theater? On the stage, you looked at the illusion and you asked me to sell it to you for $500. My reply to you was, do you mean the saw only? <laughs> And that letter, as I said, continues over a couple uh, issues. It is a huge rant from Golden. Um, but as we know, there's so much more to the story. So I went digging further into the back issues of the Lincoln Ring magazine and found various things. Now, I obviously, this is 40 pages of content alone that I'm not going to read to you. But I was finding a couple interesting things in here. Here's what I've learned. Um, P.T. Selbit, of course, is now recognized as the first person to present the illusion. Um, my notes are all out of chronological order. But there is an article. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> There's too much stuff on this. Nope, nope, nope. Should have bookmarked some of this stuff. Okay, I'm going to have references to all these articles I found, by the way, in the show notes. Uh, every show I do is archived and at uh, insidethering.show. Uh, and I will let you know where to find all these articles. Comments from UF Grant. And uh, here's an interesting one. So, the, the general story is P.T. Selbit created this illusion in England, performed it in England, 1921, January 17th. Uh, Golden performed it, uh, was it March of that same year? Just two or three months later in England. Uh, June 2nd, 1922. It was performed by Horace Golden. Completely different trick. Completely different trick. Uh, same concept, completely different trick. Here's, here's a little note. Um, December 20, 1921, uh, from a column in the Sphinx. He said, a celibate illusion sawing through a woman uh, ran a week at the Pantages Theatre uh, with Charleston Chase doing the sawing because they, they they franchised out this trick to various magicians or not even magicians just actors playing the part of a magician in order to saw people in half at the orpheum we had leroy doing golden's version of the same illusion while chase is not a magician but merely one of selbit's hired men and leroy is an old professional the general opinion among la magicians is that selbit's method is so much better and clean there is no comparison between the two <laughs> One column stated there were 83 sawings on the road touring around America. Dr. Wilson wrote, Sawing a woman in two has become a farce in Kansas City with two vaudeville houses, two burlesque houses, and three picture shows presenting the illusion. This thing has become a travesty on magic. Here's an interesting tidbit. The financial report of the Ditson Saw Company, Incorporated. For the nine months ending September 1921, show they sold during their third quarter uh, 1,127 double-handed cross-cut saws, more than they did the previous period in 1920. So something happened in 1921 that sold uh, over a thousand more of these saws all of a sudden. And that was the saw I'm going to have. It, it was such a huge illusion in magic, it even impacted the lumber industry. <laughs> I am by no means qualified to get into the whole history of this, but 
I am very qualified to research and find these articles in the Lincoln Green. I'm going to reference these in the notes and encourage you to do the same. There's fantastic articles in here talking about not only the history of the original illusion, but also the history of the modern sawing, which we know as the thin model sawing. In fact, that's this first column from Bev Bergeron, who was very much there uh, for the development, working with Mark Wilson at the time, working with um, uh, Daniels and uh, Johnny Daniel and Carl Owens, who were building them, uh, working with uh, uh, Virgil, who is some people, I mean, ev this is all debatable, but uh, who knows which side of the story you're on. Virgil uh, may have invented the one that we now know as the Wakeling song. You know, it's such, it's all these minor variations throughout history. Enough of that ramble, and enough of the, the let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Put a, put a sock in that magic news segment. <laughs> Jim, let's laser the lady in half. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, Steve Fearson's illusion uh, version of it with the lasers, too. Yeah. <laughs> let's get to some more magic. Again, uh, as I dig through the Lincoln Ring magazine, and this show is, the goal of this show is to inspire you to do the same to dig through. Uh, in fact, I have a challenge for you guys uh, out there. If you want to dig through, I have a bit of a scavenger hunt for you because I found this uh, little interesting tidbit I'm not, I'm the, from, from this challenge. Scavenger hunt challenge for the Lincoln Ring. Find a story about your home ring, your home club, that was published before you became a member. So, in my case, I joined uh, the Calgary Magic Circle in 1998, I believe it was. So if that's the case, go looking for Calgary Ring 66 uh, before 1998. And in fact, let me uh, just, again, give you a quick tutorial of where to find this stuff, right? So it's all in the Ask Alexander database, which you can access if you go to magician.org, your IBM member account. You have free access to the entire archive of the Lincoln Ring magazine as a member. And it's all right here. And it's all searchable. So in my case, if I type into the search box, I'm going to type Ring 66 in quotations. That's important. Otherwise, you'll get all the mentions of ring and all the mentions of 66, which is not at all helpful. So quotations is really key. And if I type in ring 66, look at that. It's giving me all the mentions of ring 66. And all the years, 2012 back to 1950. And I was doing this earlier, and I found Going back to 1951, I think it was, uh, a Canadian parade. They used to do a parade of Canadian magicians. I don't know if that tradition still carries on. But they used to do a parade of Canadian magicians. I found one that was not only members of the Ring 66 from decades before I was born, but also members of my new ring in Ottawa, Ring 151. In fact, it was the guy, Ray Cotty, the ring is named after. He contributed tricks. So I'm now getting to know the history of my home ring in Calgary, my home ring in Ottawa, and it's really cool stuff. So that's my challenge to you guys. Dig in. You can go back to, I'm not going to get into the whole process here. You dig into past episodes of this show, and I tell you exactly how to dig into the archives, but just try and find a story about your home ring published before you became a member. I would love to hear about what you find. You can send that to me, ryan at wowryan.com. And maybe we can talk about it on the next episode to see what you find. Now, I was inspired to do this little, uh, oh yes, and Ariel spotted. <laughs> uh, he spotted Sid Lorraine there uh, on the cover of that magazine. Absolutely. That's, this was a different Canadian parade. Got me talking about it. But... Um, uh, yeah, so I want to hear about it because this show 
is as much about you and, and your experience with the linking ring as it is mine. I'm not here to guide you through every issue. I want you to dig in and discover. Now, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you something I discovered. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, I'm so scattered tonight. Before I get to that, I do want to point out this idea of a scavenger hunt was in, in itself inspired by the linking ring. Uh, Skip Way writes a column called Polishing the Rings, and it's uh, all about activities and ideas to enhance your local ring. And this month he wrote about scavenger hunts and how you can incorporate them into your ring meetings. And I thought it was a really cool idea, and I wanted to incorporate that into this show. So thank you, Skip, for inspiring the, the idea. Now, magic. This is another uh, idea. I was going through, I don't even remember what I was looking for, some, some stuff. But I didn't find that stuff. This is what I talk about, how just wandering through the pages, who knows what you'll find. I found this. This is an optical illusion, but I think it reveals a lot about humanity. Especially these days. Because when you look at this, it doesn't quite make sense, right? Because if you look at one half of it, you think you know what's going on. You think you know exactly what you see, right? But except the bottom doesn't line up. It doesn't make sense, right? So here's the thing. Some people look at that top half and they think they know exactly what's going on. They think there's just three sticks and that's all you need to know. Is three sticks? Uh, it doesn't matter. Even if they only see half of it, when in fact the truth reveals nobody knows what's going on, right? Same thing on the other half. You can cover it up. It looks like a block. But even though people might think it's just a block, it's not really the case. They think that, but the fact of the matter is, nobody knows what's going on. People look at half the picture and they think they see everything they need to know. And that reveals an awful lot about uh, humanity. And this little idea stuck out to me. Uh, this, is, this is a kind of a uh, prototype work in progress. But I thought it was a super cool idea. And it comes from a parade... Oh, not that one. Comes from this one. 1989 December Lincoln Ring Parade by Bill Weldon. And he had uh, a series of illusions with interesting little wrinkles added to them called Can You Believe Your Eyes? And if you can see in the picture there, it talks about this illusion with some flaps on there. And that was the whole idea. His, his I think, was uh, meant for stage. Um, so I'm trying to adapt it to make it uh, a little bit, a little bit more uh, close upable, if that's a word. <laughs> so I'm working, I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. But I thought the concept, and especially I love paper magic and talking about how magic ties in with perception. I thought it was a really clever twist on that um, idea. So you can have that illusion, and depending on how you look at it, you see things that aren't really there, right? So, you never know what's going to stand out and what's going to inspire you. And I have another regular columnist, not only in the Linking Ring magazine, but also becoming a regular part of this show, only because he led the way for many years creating video supplements to his card corner column. And I've got the latest uh, Latest from his column from Mike Powers, the Poker Player's Surprise. Hello, and welcome to the Card Corner Online. This is the November 2020 edition. This month, we're going to do another variation of Poker Player's Picnic from Royal Road to Card Magic. Last month, we had my variation of an item from Harapan Ong's book, Principia. That was Harapan's take on Poker Player's Picnic, a really cool item that you should check out. Uh, this time, the trick will be called Poker Player's Surprise. It's a completely different take on Poker Player's Picnic. The cool thing is that it's going to be presented to your lay audience uh, as a trick that you're explaining to them. And at the end, they will actually be able to do Poker Player's Picnic. 
but along the way you will show that you have magical superpower way more than just the trickery that you're teaching in that item. So let's go ahead and take a look at the demonstration, Poker Player's Surprise. When I'm working for real people, I'm often asked to teach a trick. They'd like to show magic to their friends. This is what I do. I tell them that they will pick up their deck and go through and remove the aces. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm going to up jog the four aces as I explain to them how to accomplish this little bit of magic for their friends. So I have the four aces on top of the deck. I should show you what they are. There's the spade, the diamond, the club, and the heart. So the aces are going to start on top of the deck, right? So you place the aces here secretly. Don't let your spectators know that these are the aces. Now have somebody cut uh, about a quarter of the deck to the right. And then make similar packets, three more packets, so that at the end you have one, two, three, and four packets. And remember, your aces are starting right over here. Now you can have, you can have the packets shuffled if you want. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but sometimes it just has a, a feeling of more randomness. But just don't shuffle this packet because you need those aces to stay on top. Okay, so now the premise is going to be that the spectator is told to take a uh, packet on the left and to burn three cards. That means to take three cards from the top and put them to the bottom. They then deal a card onto each of the other three piles. So keep in mind what's happening. There's one card on top of your aces at this point. Now they take the next pile, and again, they burn three cards. You don't have to look at them. It doesn't really matter what they are. And then they deal a card on top of each pile. So at this point, there are now two cards on top of your aces. Uh, they now do again, burn three cards, and deal a card onto each of the piles, just like this. So now you can see what's going on. There are now three cards on top of your aces. So if you burn those three cards, right, take them to the bottom, you're now dealing an ace onto each of these piles. And that, of course, will leave you with an ace over here. And each of the piles subsequently has an ace. Now you can just turn them all over, or you can do a more theatrical kind of thing. Like you can just, you know, wave your hand, make a magic gesture, and then turn it over, act as though you're summoning an ace and then the ace comes up like this. So, you know, it's up to you. You can just turn them all over. The aces are there. That's going to be a big surprise. Or I like to kind of be a little bit more theatrical. Now, I've, I've taught you how to do this trick, uh, but you're probably wondering what magicians do. Do magicians do this trick in that exact same way? And the answer is no, we don't. We have special magical powers that allow us to do this. I can just take these cards and run them through my hands like that, and the aces immediately appear back on the packets. Of course, that leaves us wondering what these cards are. They must have exchanged places with the aces. Actually, I just had all the kings do the exchanging for a cool-looking ending. Here's an alternate ending for the routine. We'll pick it up from right near the end where you've just turned over all the aces on top of the packets. So I think it's clear that if you start with the four aces on top of the deck, create the piles. Of course, your spectators don't know about the aces. At the end, there'll be three cards on top of the aces. They'll get burned, and you'll be dealing the aces out, and you'll end up just like this. Now, you may be wondering uh, if magicians do this trick exactly the same way. And the answer is no. Magicians would start and end in a completely different way. We might take the aces out, but we wouldn't have to secretly do that whole process. We can just snap our fingers over the aces, and they would immediately reappear on top of the piles. So we'd have one, two, three, and four aces. Now, sometimes people say, uh, I wouldn't want to play poker with you. You'd give yourself the four aces. And I point out that the four aces are not the highest hand in poker, the royal flush in spades is the highest hand. That's what we would do. That's slightly disorienting, watching someone perform a magic trick that turns into a tutorial but is actually a magic trick in the end. <laughs> Gotta shake your head out. Remember where you are.
thank you very much, uh, Mike, for, for making those videos and allowing me to include them on the show. I appreciate that. And I want to make my call out to those watching. I would absolutely love to feature you and your performances on this uh, show. As you've seen tonight by my performances, it's not a high bar. <laughs> it's not a, there's not, no expectations. This is, this, is, this is about learning magic more than showing off things you've mastered. This is about digging into the Lincoln Ring, finding something, playing with it for uh, an hour or an afternoon, and sharing your discovery. That's what I would love to see, and I would very much welcome any videos or contributions in that sense. You can always send them along to me directly, get in touch with me through Facebook, or by email, ryan at wowryan.com. Or you can check out uh, past episodes of the show, Inside the Ring dot show. This is now number four. Uh, so there's three you maybe haven't seen. Maybe you haven't even been watching this one. Who knows? Point is, they're all there. <laughs> and thank you guys for watching and commenting along uh, on the show. As I said, the virtual applause is all we have in these times. Much appreciated. I don't think I have anything more, but I did want, I, I in my scatteredness earlier, I did miss one part of my uh, sawing and half research that I found kind of interesting. Uh, and it was an article from uh, 1988. It was another two-part article. And it was from, uh, it's called Trooping with the Sawing in Two, written by George Johnstone. George was uh, someone who worked on uh, the... Um, I'm trying to remember if he was with Thurston as well, but he worked on the Blackstone show, Hera Blackstone Sr. show. And he, he said he actually saw P.T. Selbert perform the original sawing trick. And he said, uh, I was present at this opening. When Selbert asked for volunteers to come up onto the stage, I was one of the several men who complied. At the end of the act, Selbert thanked us individually giving us each a small gold-plated saw, saying, I would like to give you this little golden saw as a thank you for helping me out. Later on, uh, he met Selbit again, had a chance to talk with him. He said, I told him that I was on the committee on the opening show, and then I told him, I wonder if you're aware of the fact that when you gave me that little saw, you were advertising your competition by saying, this little golden saw. Of course, his competition in the sawing being golden, Horace Golden. He was a gold. I thought that was a weird little, little twist uh, of fate. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to saw on out of here. I'll saw you later. I, uh, in the words of uh, somebody, uh, he said, I, I came, I sawed, I conquered. And you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And oh, I did see I did see a comment. I didn't want to pass by. Uh, Debbie says that was great. The original trick Mike performed by IBM Ring a couple of years ago during a monthly member lecture series. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike Powers lectured through uh, not that long ago, um, and he's been doing his card corner column for many years. If you want card tricks. You, you, it's there, man. You got it. As a member of the IBM, you have an unlimited supply. So, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and watching. And please do contribute. Step up in magic as Simone being the great example of it. And selfishly, I'd love it if you step up and, and send something my way for this show. <laughs> have a good night. I'm glad you enjoyed the news. Uh, thank you very much. Paul, thank you very much, Charles. And I will see you next month with who knows what, because I don't know what's going to be in the next issue. I don't know anything that you don't already know. Uh, what is this? Uh, loved your interview with the fabulous Simone. I, I, she did all the hard work, absolutely. 
<laughs> I appreciate that, Debbie. I appreciate you watching. Uh, and do I have anything else? Oh, yeah, I do have one thing else. Just a little note. I do wanted to sh just to be clear with people. The, the IBM I, I overheard at the at the meeting on Saturday. They are very well aware and struggling with the mail delays. So some of you may not have even received your January Lincoln ring. And I just want everyone to know while I'm here, they know, don't worry about it. It'll show up eventually. <laughs> uh, be, please be patient and look forward to reading what's coming in the mail. <laughs>